Hello and welcome to this webinar from Field Fisher Silicon Valley. We're delighted that you have chosen to join us today. Um, we're talking about automated decision making and specifically how automated decision making is regulated under European data protection laws, including the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR. It's obviously um, an important topic and one that's becoming increasingly important given the rise in automated technologies and artificial intelligence in our lives and the increasing number of applications and use cases and also the role that technology has in making decisions about our lives and potentially decisions that have an important or significant impact on us. So we're going to spend the next half an hour or so talking about how automated decision making is regulated by the GDPR, specifically Article 22. And uh, we're going to walk through some practical tips on how you can uh, address this pretty challenging and difficult area of compliance. Let's start off with some introductions. So my name is Richard Lorne. I'm a senior associate at Field Fisher, and I'm joined by two wonderful colleagues. We have Robert Fretz, who's another senior associate, and Annie McLaughlin, who is a current trainee, but a future star lawyer, no doubt. Um, so. We're going to, uh, as a team, talk you through Article 22. And what we've got set out is a bit of a flow chart which explains both the definition and some of the requirements. I should also mention that we are re-recording this session. Um, the original live version that went out, unfortunately, we had some technical issues, which do happen from, uh, from time to time, and we weren't able to present the slides. So we're re-recording this um, so that you guys can see the full slide deck. Right, before we get into the detail, um, it's important to set the scene, and uh, there are a few points that we should make. The first one is that today we are talking about the concept of automated decision making as defined by the GDPR, and how that is regulated by Article 22. Now, you may have seen automated decision making um, uh, referred to in a number of different contexts, including in uh, non-legal context or maybe in the context of other laws um, but uh, it's important to remember that today we are talking about the specific definition uh, under the GDPR and it is quite a narrow um, and specific definition that we're talking about. The second um, thing to mention is that uh, the GDPR regulates um, automated decision making and it also regulates profiling um, but these are you've got to remember these are two separate concepts so you may be profiling individuals as part of automated decision making but article 22 isn't concerned with profiling it's concerned with this narrower concept of automated decision making if we could just go back to the last slide um, we've got some examples on screen of where article 22 might be relevant so one classic example is financial services. So let's say you're an individual and you're applying for credit or a loan and the bank or financial institution is using automated technology to determine your eligibility for that credit or loan. So it's using AI perhaps to um, assess your application, maybe reviewing your credit history and making a, an automatic decision about whether to grant you that credit or loan. That's the kind of area where Article 22 may be implicated. Another classic example is recruitment. So if you are using automated uh, systems and tools within your recruitment process, potentially to determine whether an applicant is going to move to the next stage of a recruitment process or whether they're eligible for a particular role, again, that potentially might come within scope. Some other examples include the gig economy. You know, if technology is determining who's getting a job, how they're getting it, how much they're getting paid, again, you know, those are important decisions affecting individuals. Anti-fraud and KYC is, is a good example where individuals may be tracked and profiled to determine uh, a particular risk score or um, whether there's potentially fraudulent uh, or suspicious activity and therefore to determine whether to grant them access to a particular service or not. And naturally healthcare. Let's say there's uh, sophisticated technology used in um, diagnosing and then administering healthcare and the potential impact of that on individuals. It's worth mentioning that um, as technology plays an increasingly important role in our lives and in broader contexts, 
it's quite possible that Article 22 is going to become more and more relevant and potentially applicable in new and novel scenarios. Um, and we're, we're living in a quite exciting time for AI. So just to throw out one example, let's say there's an AI powered chatbot and it is uh, providing advice or counseling services and potentially, you know, is that service making decisions about the user? Uh, and are those decisions potentially having an important or significant impact on the user? You know, that's just uh, an open question, not something we're going to be considering today, but it's just an example of where these new exciting use cases for technology are potentially um, having more important role in our lives and where we need to be thinking about Article 22. Um, another point to make is that if you are making automated decisions, about people, this is a pretty challenging area of compliance. And that's not only because the rules under Article 22 of the GDPR are quite strict, but also you may need to think about additional rules and implementation under local national laws. So not only is the GDPR going to be relevant, but there could be additional considerations um, at the individual member state level. And finally, before we, we dive into that uh, definition, we should also mention that Article 22 is relevant for controllers. So where you are acting as a controller, you have to be thinking about Article 22. And typically, if you're a service provider, you might be providing services in your capacity as a processor, and therefore, you, you don't consider Article 22 to be relevant. You're not you know, the relevant entity making uh, decisions about individuals. You're simply providing a service to a customer. Um, who is then making decisions. However, um, if you're actually a service provider and acting as a controller, then you still might need to think about Article 22. So I'll give you an example. An example could be, let's say you're a credit rating agency and you're generating credit scores about individuals and you are acting as a processor, rather a controller, where you're acting as a controller when you're doing that. Now, even though you are uh, providing services to a bank and other financial institutions and you are furnishing them with credit reports and the, it is the bank or the institution that is then using that information to make decisions about those individuals, could you potentially be within scope of Article 22? Well, actually, that question is currently being considered by the EU's highest courts, the CJEU. That's the scenario that it has to consider. And the question is whether if a service provider is acting as a controller, could it also potentially be caught by Article 22? And is it potentially making decisions as well when it's acting within that supply chain? That's an important case to watch if you are providing services to others and you're acting as a controller. Right, with that said, let's dive into the details. So on screen now we have this definition of automated decision making under, under Article 22. As you can see, there are three core elements. So the first is that you are processing somebody's personal data to make a decision about them. The second element is that uh, the decision is based solely on automated processing. That means that there is enough human involved in the review or in making that decision. There is no human in the loop and it's solely based on automated technology. The third element is that the decision has a legal or similarly significant effect on the data subject. And the uh, GDPR itself doesn't you know, provide a concrete definition of when that might arise, but we do have guidance and, and case law that we can draw on um, to provide some examples. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so yeah, that's the definition. Well, you know, now we're going to step through the definition, considering whether it's applicable to you and navigating Article 22 and, and how you're going to comply if you are a call by that definition. So I'll hand over to Rob now, who's going to start walking us through that flowchart. Thanks, Richard. So Article 22 is a little bit convoluted. Um, and as we've said, there's a bit of guidance and already some case law on it. So what we thought we would do is to break it down into some more manageable chunks. So at its core, Article 22 is about not making decisions which would harm an individual. And the GDPR refers to these as legal and similarly significant effects. 
So the structure of Article 22 is to prohibit these kinds of decisions and only permit them in certain limited circumstances, subject to some protections, uh, namely the opportunity for a user to have their say and for a human to review that automated decision to validate or change it. So let's go through each of the steps in Article 22 and discuss what they mean in more detail. And as a quick aside, the eagle eye will note that Article 22 refers to the data subject having a right not to be subject to a decision. However, both the ICO and the EDPB have clarified that in fact, this is a prohibition unless one of those three exceptions applies that we will discuss, rather than a right for the data subject to exercise um, in their own time. So let's dive into these elements of Article 22 in more detail. Well, first of all, we're going to look at um, whether there has been a decision based solely on automated processing. So if the decision you are taking is actually subject to human review before the decision is taken, even if you also use some automated elements, then the prohibition will not apply. What's important here is that human involvement must be sufficiently meaningful. So a human rubber stamping of the automated decision without giving it any proper thought is not going to be enough. And Annie is going to give you some pointers later on how to avoid a rubber stamping exercise. One of the examples given by the ICO is that of an employee being issued with a warning about their late attendance of work based on the employer's automated clocking in system flagging the fact that the employee had been late on a defined number of occasions. Although in that example, there is some automated flagging, provided that the employer's HR team review that data before issuing the warning, that would not be classed as a solely automated decision. We also wanted to point out another scenario. Uh, this is in the anti-fraud context. So if you imagine an anti-fraud system which accepts or rejects users to a service, if that system flags some users uh, with a low level of fraud and, and that allows them to use a service, um, it might also detect a high level of fraud and reject certain users from the service. But what about those users who are kind of somewhere in the middle? Well, what happens if it flags those for human review? Does that element of human review for those people in the middle mean that a decision is not based solely on automated decision making for all those data subjects? Well, I think there the answer is no. The fact that some users are subject to human review still means that there are many users who are not subject to that human review, and therefore um, the prohibition will apply. Let's now look at the next limb of Article 22.1. So this is about decisions which have a legal or a similarly significant effect on a user. It's only these kinds of decisions that are covered by the GDPR rules. So what does uh, this mean exactly? Well, the guidance provides for a few examples, but as usual with these kinds of guidance, it only touches on the extremities and doesn't really dive into the more marginal decisions. A decision producing a legal effect is something that affects a person's legal status or their legal rights. So for example, when a person uh, in view of their profile is entitled to a particular social benefit conferred by law, uh, such as a housing benefit, that would be a uh, legal effect. Meanwhile, a decision that has similarly significant effects is something that has an equivalent impact on an individual circumstances, behavior or choices. But what does that mean? Well, the Article 29 Working Party Guidelines, which have been endorsed by the EDPB, say that for data processing to significantly affect someone, the effects of the processing must be sufficiently great or important to be worthy of attention. In other words, the, the decision must have the potential to significantly affect the circumstances, behavior, or choices of the individuals concerned, or have a prolonged or permanent impact on the data subject, or at its most extreme, lead to the exclusion or discrimination of individuals. So we thought through a few more examples of what are actually contained in the, um, in the guidance, which might be applicable to some of those kinds of companies that Richard was referring to earlier. Uh, and in particular, we're looking at the sort of online verification space uh, for age or identity. Um, 
each use of ADM, ADM will, of course, be quite fact specific. Uh, but we do think there are some general trends for certain industries. Uh, for example, in the healthcare industry, that's more likely to um, have a significant effect than, for example, e-commerce. And so you can see some examples um, in those two columns there of kinds of decisions which are more likely or less likely to fall within uh, this bucket. And Annie, over to you. Thanks, Rob. There are some exceptions to the prohibition set out in Article 22.1. The first one we will consider is when the significant decision is based on the data subject's explicit consent. If a data subject gives their explicit consent to the processing, then the prohibition does not apply and you are free to make automated decisions which produce legal effects and or similarly significantly affect the data subject. As the slide indicates, you will, you will need to see, still provide an appeals process, but we will come back to this point later. First, we need to consider what explicit consent is under the GDPR. It is a high bar to reach and goes beyond the requirements of ordinary consent under the GDPR. So it must be freely given, which is where the orange box on the screen comes into play. In order for a data subject to give their freely given consent, in some circumstances, you may need to give them a human review alternative to give them genuine choice. This should be offered with equal prominence to the automated processing. As per regular consent, explicit consent must also be be a clear and affirmative action, usually met by providing a tick box, clicking a button or toggling. It should be specific and informed. This requires the same sort of disclosures at the time of collecting consent as standards consent under the GDPR. But in addition, articles 13 to F and 14 to G provide that some additional specific information must be provided to a data subject if you carry out automated decision making. This includes meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and envisaged consequences of such proce processing for the data subject. And don't forget to notify the data subject of their rights, including the, the right to withdraw consent at any time. According to regulator guidance, explicit consent refers to the way consent is expressed by the data subject. It should be an express statement of consent. So how does this work in the online context? This requirement can be met by requiring a user to fill in an electronic form, by sending an email, or by electronic signature. An example the EDPB use is of a website offering an explicit consent screen to the user that contains yes and no checkboxes with text clearly indica indicating the consent, i.e. I hereby consent to the processing of my data. And of course, all of the other elements that I just mentioned must also be present. The other two exceptions available under Article 22.2 are where the decision is necessary for entering into or performing a contract with the user or where the processing is authorised by law. Taking the first one of those, necessary for entering into or performing a contract with the user. This includes where it is necessary for pre-contractual processing. For example, to sift through tens of thousands of applications, which due to the high volume, it would, be would not be practically possible to identify fitting candidates without using automated means to sift out irrelevant applications. In terms of what is considered necessary in the EEA, you might need to demonstrate how the main subject matter of the specific contract with the data subject cannot, as a matter of fact, be performed if the specific processing of the personal data in question does not occur does not occur, whereas in the UK, a slightly softer position is taken. It must be a targeted and reasonable way of meeting your obligations. It's also worth noting that the wording of this exception, Im exception implies that the decision making could potentially be carried out by a different controller than the one who is party to the contract with the individual. As it says, if the decision is necessary for entering into or performance of a contract between the data subject and a data controller and not the data controller. Richard just mentioned a case where they are looking at this point. The final exception under Article 22.2 is where the decision is authorised by union or member state law, which also lays down suitable measures to safeguard the data subject's rights. Recital 71 says that this could Im include the use of automated decision making for monitoring and preventing fraud and tax evasion 
or to ensure the security and reliability of a service provided by the controller. The application of this exception will vary depending on the specific member state law, but something to flag is the second part of this exception, being that the union or member state law also lays down suitable measures to safeguard the data subject's rights. To give an idea, in the UK, the Data Protection Act provides for additional safeguards, such as compelling, in controllers, sorry, compelling controllers to notify a data subject in writing that, that a decision has been taken based solely on automated processing and giving data subjects the right to appeal or request a new decision not based solely on automated processing. Estonia also provide for a similar appeals process in local law in the insurance context. Generally, outside of the UK, it is likely that the additional safeguards requirement is also met by providing a similar appeals process. Before we move on to the need to offer an appeals process under Article 22.3, if none of the exceptions I've gone through apply, then human review is requ required as the Article 22.1 prohibition applies and you cannot make a significant decision based solely on automated decision making. Um, so now we should move on to the final box in the diagram, as well as the orange box that applied when we said, yes, we are relying on explicit consent. Article 22.3 states that if you are relying on necessity for entering into or performance of a contract or see explicit consent, then you must provide the data subject with the right to obtain human intervention to express his or her point of view and to contest the decision. This point teams with the local law requirement, at least in the UK, that I just discussed um, to provide an appeals process um, when you are relying on the authorised by law exception, means that if you are relying on an exception, an appeals process is likely required. So we've just put together this slide that contains some practical do's and don'ts for you to think about when implementing an appeals process in your business. Taking the first two things to do. You should have a clear process in place, including policies and procedures which enable individuals to challenge or appeal an automated decision. You should be clear about this to users, ensuring they are aware of the right to appeal and the grounds for doing so. The people or person carrying out the review should be suitably qualified and authorised to change a decision where it is found to be appropriate to do so. They shouldn't just be there to rubber stamp decisions. It has to be a meaningful review, which considers all of the information available, including additional information provided by the data subject on appeal. It's really important to understand the logic and methodology behind the automated decision. This is particularly relevant to help catch any potential bias, but also it's important to meet other obligation, ob obligations, such as sharing certain information about the logic to data subjects. Not to mention that it will also help you to formulate a suitable response on the outcome of an appeal to a data subject. It's best practice to keep an audit trail showing key decision points that form the basis of the decision, showing why one decision was made and not the other. This will help you comply with your accountability obligations and it will also assist you in the event that a data subject makes a complaint about your processing. The only point on there that I think I've missed is don't take too long to respond. You should check local laws for any nuances, but under GDPR, you should reply to a request for a review from a data subject within one month. I'm now going to hand you back over to Richard, who will highlight some other things to consider when carrying out automated decision making. Great, thank you, Annie. So um, that's been a tour of Article 22, if you will. Um, but before we finish, we wanted to flag some other points um, if you are engaged in automated decision making. Um, and these are general points around GDPR compliance. So firstly, don't forget that you should think about how you are making automated decisions about individuals while complying with the fundamental principles under the GDPR. These include things like establishing your lawful basis, um, making sure that you're complying with data minimization and purpose limitation principles. Um, but some of those principles are particularly relevant for automated decisions. For example, how are you addressing your 
uh, requirement to provide transparency to individuals around how you're using their data and making automated decisions about them. So, for example, are you providing uh, meaningful information about the logic of the algorithms that are used to make those uh, decisions? Are you explaining the significance and possible consequences of those decisions to individuals? And are you also explaining to individuals what rights they have, including the right to contest those automated decisions? Um, and in some cases, it may be appropriate to include that kind of information in your standard privacy disclosures, like your privacy notice. But in some cases, you may feel like additional layers um, of uh, disclosure would be appropriate. Similarly, fairness is a big one in this area. So how are you ensuring that your use of people's data to make those decisions is fair? For instance, have you implemented processes to prevent errors in your algorithms or to prevent inaccuracies in the, in the data set that are used to determine decisions about individuals? And are you taking steps to identify and address any potential bias and discrimination? All of that is a particularly relevant where we're relying on technology to make decisions for us and ensuring that that's always going to be fair. The second bullet point on our list here is around special category data. Now, we haven't mentioned this uh, previously, but some of the use cases we've talked about could potentially involve the use of special category data under the GDPR, for instance, somebody's health data. Um, suffice it to say, if you're using that kind of data, then you also need to think about those conditions under Article 9 and seeing how you are satisfying at least one of those conditions to use the data. DPIA, this is data protection impact assessment. Well, frankly, if you are making important decisions about individuals impacting their rights and you're using automated technologies to do that, it's highly likely that you should be completing a data protection impact assessment to run through the risks and identify um, how you're taking steps to comply with the GDPR and address any residual risks. So that is one to always consider, I think, with um, ADM. Um, and then otherwise on the slide, we've mentioned this is the name of the uh, case before the CJEU that's considering whether a service provider acting as controller is also caught by Article 22. Um, look out for updates from Phil Fisher when we have that decision handed down. Um, I'm not sure yet when, it, when the decision might be coming, but look out for potential updates in our blog uh, for, for commentary on that case. And then lastly, no doubt you are, uh, have heard that um, the EU is proposing to introduce a new AI Act, a risk-based framework for regulating AI systems and services within the EU. Um, now that AI Act is still in process. It's still at the draft stage. It's possible that it could be finalized this year, maybe next year, um, but it's certainly on its way and it could have an impact for certain types of AI tools and services, although it doesn't necessarily apply to all AI, but it lists out certain use cases uh, and, and imposes requirements on those use cases. The point here is that that regulation is not intended to replace or supersede the GDPR. So both the GDPR and the AI Act will be relevant if you're using artificial intelligence and you need to think about both. And if you're using people's personal data as part of AI, then the GDPR becomes relevant. And then if you fall within the, one of those regulated use cases under the AI Act, you're also gonna need to think about your obligations under the AI Act. Um, and I guess the takeaway there is that Article 22 will remain relevant. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the webinar. I hope you found that helpful. Um, if you have any uh, comments, questions, or thoughts on Article 22 or otherwise, please get in contact with uh, a member of the Field Fisher team. Our contact details are on the slide. And also, please join us for our next webinar. So if we just go back to the previous slide for a moment, yeah. So this is the next webinar we've scheduled for Wednesday, 8th of March at 9 a.m. Pacific time. The invites should go out next week, so fairly soon. Look out for those invites. And this is a topic we're gonna to be talking about generative AI and privacy challenges and risks. Fairly a hot topic and there's a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of conversation um, out there at the moment about generative AI. And we're gonna be thinking about how you can approach the use of AI, um, generative AI within 
your products and within your tools uh, for customers or for consumers and thinking through some of the privacy implications. So we really hope you can join us then. Well, that brings us to the end. But again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.